Well, thank you very much. It's a great treat to be here. Uh, as you can imagine, a title such as the term structure of interest rates, we would go on for days. So clearly, given the occasion, I'm going to focus that topic to something a little more tractable in a little more detail. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the interest rate model that Steve developed with uh, John Cox and John Ingersoll uh, as a exemplifying of both his work and what finance has done in the term structure to, to add to it. I'm also going to take advantage that Steve and I are of the same vintage. And uh, it was a good year, Steve. <laughs> but what I mean by that is we both have lived through more than four decades of the development of finance as an academic discipline and its influence and influence by finance practice and the extraordinary events that have developed in finance over this period. And while it all seems like yesterday, and Dick Roll, of course, is another who is involved, and Gene, so I guess it's a whole crowd, but we have the same year. We're, you know, you're a big guy on vintages with your wine, so in any case. Uh, so I thought I would say a little bit to frame what Steve's work, the implications of it, by talking about the context of the time and the domain in which it was developed and operated in. Now, modern finance has been ready to, and I, that's now over half century, so it's a little hard to call it modern. But a signature feature of that is the most advanced theoretical research and empirical work have had a fundamental impact on finance practice, quite directly. Literally, the models being lifted out of the academic research or the empirical findings lifted out of the academic research and fundamentally applied. And that's been the excitement, and it's you know, continuing to this day. So if I go back just in time briefly to the 1970s to set a context, it was earlier that started, but 1970s were particularly important, particularly now after the crisis of 2008-9, to go back and remember the shocks that hit the economies, particularly U.S economy and financial system at that time. We had the failure, Bretton Woods came apart. We had had fixed currencies forever, it seemed. They're gone. What else happened? We had a small oil shock, like the price of oil went up sevenfold. Okay, that was a pretty big shock. What else was going on? U.S. Treasury interest rates were in double digits, not just in the short end of the curve, but all the way out. Maybe the reason was that at the same time, U.S. inflation was double digit. Hard to believe in the world we've been living with in since. So that's pretty big of a shock. What else happened? Well, the stock market in the United States draw in an 18 month period from 73, middle of 73 to the end of 74 dropped 50%. Well, that's pretty bad. And then what else did we have? High unemployment came to be known as stagflation. Thank goodness. This last crisis with high unemployment did not also have double-digit inflation. Imagine what policies would have to have done in that context. So this was a time where enormous shocks hit the system, particularly related to the financial system in the U.S. Now, what I want to call attention to is the response. The response was enormous amount of really important financial innovation. A wide array of risk markets were created financial futures, options markets for insurance and financial insurance and so forth. In the U.S., we developed ERISA, the pension, modern pension system. We had May Day, where we got rid of negotiated commissions, which opened the door to the institutionalization of investing that we take for granted. Vanguard, by the way, just happened in 1975, right after May Day, the whole implementation of indexing. And so what other sorts of uh, uh, things that we had? We had international diversification take place. And then by the end of, the, of that decade, but it was, it was almost a, just a continuum all the way through, we developed some very important markets. We developed the national mortgage market. And ever since that happened, we've always had mortgage money in the United States, which wasn't true in the so-called good old days prior to having that. Okay. What else did we develop? Well, we had the uh, development of 
well, I would say, I don't know if I'd call it a development. We had an outcome, which is influencing where I'm going to own. U.S. debt market, the treasury market, used to be kind of a sleepy pace, place for investors. And in fact, if you were a dealer, that was not a big profit center. <laughs> but I looked up the number. I knew Gene would be here, so I figured I'd better you know, be on there. In 1970, the U.S. debt outstanding was $371 billion. Of course, that's round off error today. By 1980, it had gone up 2.3 times, okay? And by 1985, the year that Steve's paper was published on interest rates, it was at 1.8 billion, another doubling in five years. And by 1990, it was 3.2 trillion. All right, did I say billion? I meant 1.8 trillion, okay? So you had this enormous expansion in the US government market. You have the creation of a national mortgage market which completely transformed the industry. And out of that, you had to have various kinds of instruments be created on mortgages to help things like entities that were doing processing of mortgages to hedge risk. There were all kinds of an explosion of risks in interest rates that had to be dealt with. So for Marissa, we had the pension industry. We had to worry about evaluating pension liabilities and how you hedge them, something that's routinely done today without thought. But that wasn't in that time practice. So this is all by way of coming to the subject matter of fixed income models and the term structure and their importance and how it relates to practice is to say that during this period of time there was a great need for the development of sophisticated models. As with the earlier development of the options market, the transformation to high-speed, large-scale, global market for things like mortgages and U.S. Treasuries transformed what was needed to actually operate in those markets. You could not do it by just saying, hmm, I think this is about right. And you put an ad in the newspaper for your sales of the, of the uh, positions. Now, from all of this, out comes a, a, a model, and this is Steve's model. But I want to then now take you to the second piece. Okay, whoops, not there yet. All right, well, I'm almost there. The second piece is the history of the model. Not all term structure models, but I think it's fair to say the genesis of the Cox and Yusor West model and the exemplification that it came with it. And I can tell the story because as my mentor and, and colleague Paul Salmon told the story 30 years ago in this context, I almost got there in terms of an interest rate model, but I didn't. So let me explain what I mean by that. Okay, here's the history, and you may not be able to read this, but that's okay, the equations aren't important. Here's the history of the kinds of models, and what I mean by the kinds of models, where you have dynamics of the interest rates formally put out, you have them represented in kind of stochastic processes that fit into portfolio models. Sort of a, 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 a I happen to have them in continuous time because that's what the Cox and Russell Russ papers in, so it's in that vintage. The first versions of that, I think, it's always dangerous, uh, you know, because as Phil Diffick pointed out, you may have missed something, was actually something I wrote, it was a paper in 1970, in which I had the interest rate following a arithmetic Brownian motion with a drift and so forth, and uh, asked the question, how would you price bonds in that world under the what now came to be known as the local expectations hypothesis, uh, so-called risk neutrality, how would those prices go? And I solved that problem. I mean, I had the general equation, but the general equation doesn't mean anything. I had, this, this was the equation I actually solved. And the price up there is the price of a zero coupon bond that pays a dollar. Now, I want to point out something about this because there's also lessons about modeling. It was a nice, easy model to solve. And economists everywhere, particularly those who often make interest rates normally distributed, you know, even though, of course, it's, at least in nominal terms, they're not supposed to go negative. Because if they're normally distributed a little bit, that's OK. That's a good approximation. Well, what this shows is that when you actually solve for the bond price, the formula up there is it's the exponential, because it's continuous time, minus the current interest rate times time. And then if the interest rate has a positive drift, then it means rates are expected to go up then the bond will be even lower to reflect that. That's the second term. And you'll notice that's multiplied by the square. So you have the current interest rate times time. That's the usual discounting. 
Then you have the square term, and if the drift is positive, that makes the bond price worth less because we expect the price to go up, so we expect the bond price. But look at the third term. It's the very volatility interest rate times the length of time to maturity cubed, and it's positive. What does that tell you? That tells you in a world where the current interest rate is 40%, where you expect the interest rate to go up at a rate of 10% a year, I'm, I'm being totally outrageous, right? If you have a volatility standard deviation of the interest rate of 1%, hardly noticeable, what is the price of a bond that pays a dollar at time T when T gets very large? Not 10 years, not 20, 50, 100. 200. Ultimately, that cubic term will dominate everything. So in the end, the price of a bond that pays a dollar almost never <laughs> is worth an infinite amount, despite the fact that interest rates are very big and positive, and they're expected to go up. Pretty nonsensical. Well, you could say this was a learning experience, but you actually learned something about modeling. You really have to be very careful these approximations that are done. Because if it's screwy out there, who knows it isn't screwy nearer in. So I would say that was a success of the sort of pointing that out, but hardly a model I would want to do any trading on, okay? The second in terms of, uh, and by the way, that was the same model I used in my option pricing paper to show the effect of stochastic interest rates, so shamelessly doing so, but pointing all of this out, so for disclosure. But the second model chronologically, I call the Cobb-Douglas growth process, because I was desperately looking for a sensible model of interest rates to come out of some kind of an equilibrium or economic model rather than just assume it. And so I took Cobb-Douglas perfection functions, assumed constant saving rates, you know, really simple economy, and worked out the dynamics of that under uncertainty with respect to either population growth or technological progress. And when you worked it all through, lo and behold, you actually got a very nice dynamic for the interest rate in the economy. Uh, this is the one that says that the interest rate is expected to change proportionally to the interest rate minus the interest rate squared. And then you have a standard deviation which is proportional to the size of interest rates. So that scales how the volatility changes. What was the problem with that? Well, it was pretty looking for the interest rate, but I couldn't get a closed form solution. I couldn't get a, there is no formula up there. Someone says maybe they've solved it by now. I'm not sure, but I surely didn't. So I suffered with, I had a model that made economic sense, but I couldn't get an answer. Now, you're all smiling, and you say, why was he worried about a closed form formula? Which is, of course, what, a, what the Cox Ingersoll Ross provided. Computation was a little different then. Those of you around know what I'm talking about. You didn't just say, oh, here's an equation, here's a, throw it in the computer, and you let it crank away at all these incredible speeds for two weeks, and you get an answer. That didn't exist. So there's a big premium on getting a closed form solution, especially in practice, where you actually had to compute the numbers and do them more than once, okay? And so closed form solution was a lot. There was a second reason. As I showed you in the first case, I gave you a closed form solution, and I showed you clearly why that pricing model was absurd, or at least one that we wouldn't believe in, right? Who would believe that you would pay an infinite amount for a dollar never paid to you, okay? Same thing with closed form formulas. You could see the whole thing. Because with numerical solutions, who knows what's going on outside? So I considered that a failure. Now, as was indicated by Phil, there was a, a, a Vasicek developed a model where he brought in mean reversion uh, in, into the model from the first one. And that at least got rid of the result that the price would go to infinity for a dollar. So it got rid of the absurdity. And it's a workhorse that's been widely used and still used, and I think Phil said he even still uses it, okay? It was a good model, but of course, it admitted to having the possibility of negative interest rates, which was still an issue, okay? And it had the feature that no matter what the level of interest rate, the volatility, instantaneous volatility was the same, which may be a little bit tough to, to swallow empirically, but I always, I, having Gene Klom around, I don't, I can, he can answer that, okay? So then what comes along? Well, what comes along is the Cox and Saul Ross model, where they had the mean reversion, which a lot of people believe makes sense, 
but they scaled, and they had the variable volatility, not a constant, but they scaled it by the square root of r. And they developed a background equilibrium model to support this, so it was there. And as a result, they came up with a beautiful and simple closed form formula that doesn't have negative interest rates. It has as also a feature. And so it allowed us to sort of have some confidence that it wasn't on the face going to give us something absurd. And I would say on that model, if we look at it now, that of course it's had many extensions. Uh, you know, there, uh, it's, as Phil himself pointed out, in a part of the paper, see Steve, that's the problem of writing two things. You should have written two papers. Then you would have gotten the other one. You wouldn't have so many of us re refinding out what you always wrote, already wrote about. Uh, but yes, they talked about a second factor. There are people that put in stochastic volatility, stochastic means. They did all these things, creating multiple factors out of it. And uh, it was a great model. It's also a great model for pricing options on these things, caps and floors and so forth. It was, it was, it was among the models that were the most tractable. Uh, so, you know, it, it was a very good model. Now, I thought for the occasion I would point out a model that I use from theirs and would actually have to do something in practice. And I've used it a lot of times. So thank you, Steve. And here's that model. And it's a multi-factor model, but as we already know, we had it. And I'm going to describe a simpler version of it. And the simple version is, in, in, in the, in the Coxinger-Sol-Ross model, the basic idea is the short rate is going along, and it's reverting towards some long-term level of interest rates, B, whatever that is, some long-term interest rate, and that it is stochastic and it has shocks to it that are proportional to the, the square root of interest rates, okay? Now, it's a single factor model and it's a single interest rate. Everything is driven by the short rate, okay? Now, what you might imagine is saying, and this is very classical, right, that Short rate, you kind of think of as related to monetary policy. I mean, there are other things that affect it, but monetary policy, we would agree, traditionally can impact short rates. What about over longer, let's say medium rates, like, you know, 10 years, five to 10, it's kind of business cycle type levels, uh, horizon. Well, those are different factors than you would expect in short-term monetary policy. And so maybe that interest rate, the ones we see for five and 10 years, are being driven by something other than monetary policy, okay? And so what we did is to take, to, to, to kind of Xerox the same equation and put a big R for a second interest rate. And you can think of that as a fixed maturity, five years zero or 10 years zero, uh, whatever you want to pick, something for the intermediate term. And what that does is that now you have, instead of the short rate pursuing some fixed long rate, it pursues the intermediate rate. So you can think of the dynamics of the model saying, the short rate is driven by things, but it's being drawn towards the longer rate, the intermediate rate, through its economics, not because it's some law of physics or something, but through the economics that eventually that short rate has to be consistent with longer term beliefs, the business cycle, or whatever you want to call it. And on the other hand, the intermediate rate, like called the business cycle rate, is ultimately being drawn towards that same very long rate that still other factors affect, whatever you want to call it, demographics or technological progress rates or whatever you believe drive long-term interest rates. And you don't have to stop there. You can get N of these. So you could have the short rate is chasing the two-year rate, the, the, inter, the, the, the weekly rate is chasing the two-year rate, the two-year rate is chasing the five-year rate, the five-year rate is chasing the 10-year rate, the 10-year rate is the 30-year rate. Do you see what I mean? And all you do is just produce more of these same equations that look like the, the cox ingers all ross equations, okay? But in doing that, you give yourself the flexibility of having more variables to explain the dynamics of the entire term structure. Rather than being driven by a single one, you have multiple ones. And the feature of that is you retain the simplicity of the CIR model, but you have the flexibility of making that model have, in principle, as many factors as you want. Now, if you have too many factors, it just explains itself. But the point being, you have that modeling flexibility, which I found very useful. It makes sense. You can explain it to people. 
And because of the structure of each one chasing the next one, the solutions to those equations, even though now we do things numerically, uh, I still like to be able to try to solve them, not just as a challenge, I like to see what they look like rather than just a bunch of numbers. Uh, and I put up the equations here as we don't have to throw them, but if you look at those equations, you have you know, two different interest rates, you have two different what we would call durations or partial durations with respect to each interest rate, and those are, have hierarchical equations in the sense that the uh, coefficient on the short-term rate is uh, uh, driven only by itself. It, you know, if you see the equation, it doesn't depend on the other two. And then on the long term, the intermediate term, that only depends on knowing what the coefficient is on the short rate and then for each successive one. So it's hierarchical in that sense, makes the solution of it rather rapid and, and uh, successful. So I wanted to put this up here because I actually use this. Now maybe Steve and Gene will tell me afterwards you shouldn't be using it, but I found that it's worked pretty well and it gives you the flexibility to have it capture actual term structures without overfitting them and to have an idea intuitively what's driving the dynamics. Rather than, you know, stochastic volatility is nice and true, but it's kind of hard to have an intuition into it. And it's very important in models that we be able to understand what the model is telling us. Uh, and I find that this is a feature. So I don't know if you call this personal or if you call it professional. I think it's a bit of both. I want to thank you for doing the model and to show how 30 years later, by the way, this is the 30th anniversary of this paper. 1985, that 30 years later, at least I and some of the people I work with are using these papers, not just for academic papers, but for actual practice and trying to have models that make sense, that you can fit, and that you have some degree of, of confidence in. So uh, that kind of covers the, the extensions in the model, and I just put this up for today to, to do it. Now, last, last thing I want to talk about, uh, actually is related to the title of the conference. This is, uh, you know, market prices, what do they tell us? Okay. And it's also related to what Steve is about to talk to us about after lunch. Now, I'll put it this way to you because I'm looking at the audience. You're of mixed vintages. And not only that, we're here in Germany, not in the United States. So, you know, it's always dangerous to tell a joke that's local when you're not local. And then in pops of that, you also get it complicated with the fact that it was at a different period of time when so many of you may not even have been uh, here, okay? But at that risk, I have to say this. There was a very well-known television show on for decades in the United States called The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And it was a, he came on and entertained people and so forth. But Johnny Carson had a sidekick you know, sort of a, 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 a man Friday who sat next to him and so forth and, you know, kind of prepared people. And one of his jobs was before every show, he would come out to you, the studio audience, and warm you up in preparation for when the star came out, Johnny, so you're all ready to go. So I've decided, without consulting our host, I've decided I'm going to play that role for Steve. And you've got lunch in between, okay? So what I'm about to do, you should see, is precisely warming you up for that talk. Now that said, I think that's enough preparation. Phil alluded to this, it's very important, that the role of financial markets in general market prices is twofold. Of course, the markets are there manifestly to facilitate transactions, people shifting risks, raising money, whatever, transactions. But it plays a very important latent function, which is a source of information. So even if you're not trading, even if you don't need to trade, even if you're forbidden from trading because you're a CEO and you're in a blackout zone so you couldn't trade if you wanted to, you still look to market prices because market prices give you information, information that is useful for your decisions. 
And the extraction of information from markets, while certainly been done you know, since the beginning of time, I mean, that's, you know, that's not new. And certainly in the term structure, people have bit term structures. The differences today from the past are in intensity, magnitude, and sophistication. What I mean by that is I'm going to show you some pictures of how you can extract Paul Bully distributions in the inter U.S. interest rate market. I believe I know what Steve is talking about, the real show. I told you Johnny Carson. I mean, he's the Johnny Carson. But in interest rate markets where you can effectively see the whole distribution looking forward. So you don't set the distribution. You don't say it's log normal or normal or gamma or whatever. You just take the whole distribution out. And it just comes from the data. And then let's think about it. I want to show you why this is fun or interesting. Fun too, maybe, but actually quite interesting and useful uh, in the context, in this context, policy, but it could also be for investing. And this comes from doing the following. Steve, in a, his paper on option and efficiency, pointed out that basically you could span all the securities, the arrow securities, the fundamental uh, building block securities for in a securities market using options. So you had enough options with enough different strike prices and enough different maturities, you could create essentially an arrow security market, which is a price for payoffs in just about all the relevant states, so whether ever it's based on. And that's, that's what um, uh, he did. And, and as was mentioned, uh, Breeden and Litzenberg developed a continuous version of this. And I shamelessly, with permission, borrowed a couple of of uh, pictures from them because they'd done the runs for me um, to talk to show you on just the interest rate market. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. One, because we're going to hear Steve, but two, uh, you know, I'm looking at the clock. So here's what happened. Here's, well, first of all, before, here's what we're looking at. We're looking at announcements by Ben Bernanke in the period 208, 209, 212. And what we're looking at is the market before then, at a time, sometime before then, and we're computing, we're using the Ross type ways to generate first a, the prices for all the states, and from that extract the probability or the implied probability for all the states. Does everybody, I mean, I, do you, so you have these whole distribution is generated solely by prices. What prices? Caps and floors. Those are puts and calls in the U.S. Treasury market. They're options. And there's so many of them, so many different maturities and so many different strike prices that you can, on a routine basis, have a pretty decent spanning of, of the distribution. So that's what makes it a particularly interesting example uh, here. So what I wanted to show you here is from then. The blue is at a, uh, the later date. The pink is at an earlier date. And what you're looking there is a histogram of probabilities. Just think that as a, like a probability distribution. So on the pink date, you took a look at the forward-looking distributions implied by the caps and floors. And you see it's a pretty low probability of having a 1%. Or two, and you see sort of it's centered around 4% or 5%. And then you see some out in the right tail. Just, just look at pictures, don't try to analyze it, okay? That's what the, the market was saying the distribution looked like. Then by, Dece that was in June of 08. By December of 08, we know a few things happened in between, and we had the announcement, the famous announcement, in, in fact, of driving the rates down. And what do you see? You see the blue. The distribution goes all down left, so the whole thing shifts for the future. That's what you expected, right? You know, if you make a powerful announcement and believe it, that moves the distribution here. Okay, so it's interesting. But what's nice is it gives you the actual shape. It doesn't just give you an expectation or something. It gives it. Now, let's move ahead from December. Let's move ahead to March, okay? And compare December to April 30th. In March, what happened? Mr. Bernanke announced that he was going to keep rates low for an extended period, new information. Not just temporarily, but 
to build X for a considerable long time. Now what I want to show you, and this is just from the data, is remember the pink is the in December, the blue is what the market moved to. So the blue is later. Now what would you, th I think most people think, if the Fed chairman says, it's not just going to be short term, we're going to extend it to a, a substantial period. You would expect those forward rates, you know, the, pro the probabilities for, to move in the same way, to the left, to go down, or at least to stabilize. What do you see in the picture? They went the opposite way. The blues, the, let's look at the density. The blues are high, more to higher interest rates, not lower interest rates. Now you can interpret, I'm not going to read tea leaves, but I would think that if I was a central bank, I would find this useful information. We announced something that was designed to tell the market, and some very serious people. You know, the treasury market is not populated by taxi drivers, ribbon clerks, and college professors. These are the largest markets, interest rate markets in the world. And these are, you know, sovereign wealth funds, pension. It doesn't mean they don't get things wrong. It doesn't mean, I guess, they can also be a, irrationally exuberant. But these are pretty serious people, and there are a fair number of them. And this is what the market, that market was saying. You, you do the, your own interpretation. I think that's useful information. And I think it's much richer information than, say, implied volatility, the fear, you know, the the VIX, the fear, where you just get a single parameter moving. I don't mean that that's not useful too, but this gives you basically the whole distribution. And you can look out three years, five years, you've got a similar reaction. So second kind of thing, same kind of announcement, but very different. The last one comes from 2012, in which you had a situation where you had the Fed uh, you know, ties to the rate to unemployment. It doesn't matter what the event was. But what I want you to see is, look at the blue and the pink. Do you notice the pink is higher on the bottom? The, just higher. the blue moved to the right, but it also moved to the left. In other words, it piled up in a region between 2 and 4%. So one case, it shifted the way you thought, down. The second case, it was perverse. Everything shifted in the opposite direction. And this one, the shape of the distribution concentrated between 2 and 4. Now, I only put these up here not to say anything else then to illustrate in the time here the power of being able to use market, these market prices to look at, to look at it, have a sense of the future. And these are forward looking rather than historical. Historical yesterday is history. And not only that, these are com compu computable in part because of the Cox signature total loss, in my opinion. These are computable rather rapidly and quickly for market data, okay? So you can use these things to, to extract it. Well, I'm not gonna dwell on this more, and I know I took a risk with you, Steve, even touching on this subject for two reasons. One is, you know, of course, he's gonna speak about the much broader one, but I'm sure and know that what he's gonna talk about, as I say, is the main event. This is the warm-up, this is the sort of basic, simple, you know, simplest version that the rest of us might try our hand at, okay? So I wanted you to see the power of using market prices, how much information we can extract, whether you're a policymaker or an investor, okay? And this is not, wasn't doable in the past. The data weren't available, the computational techniques, and the models weren't available and experience the learning curve of how you do, it, do them right. And I think this is very exciting. This is opening the door to a very big area, in my view, for the field of finance that goes beyond its traditional boundaries, but really moves it to other areas of extraction. And it's, again, I will say, it's not that other parts of economics or policy haven't looked at prices to get something from the future, but from the experiences we have here, we can do it. And I want to say in the case of why is the Cox ASR loss file so important, let me summarize. Number one, I've already said, it provided a closed form solution at a time when that was particularly valuable. It's still valuable, okay, of a sensible model that you could fit and understand. And the next thing it also did is it changed the ability for hedging. 
because it's one thing to look at prices. By the way, could you hear me back there all this time, or have I been too far from the? Because you should have put your hand up if you care. OK. Uh, the second one is you know, we do more than just look at prices. We act on them. So if I'm responsible for a pension or managing the assets that are supposed to pay for that pension, one, I want to know what the risk is. I want to know the price of those liabilities. So I need to price them. But what else do I want to be able to do? I want to hedge them. Now, to hedge fixed liabilities, you need some notion of what the quality duration or something else, which wasn't bad. It was better than just using maturity. But it's pretty crude. And when you're playing for large stakes in volatile markets, there's big value to have improved models for hedging and improved markets and tools for doing the hedging. So Macaulay, or some version of that modified Macaulay duration that you may have learned and may still use, is OK in you know, back of the envelope calculations. But if you're running a portfolio or responsible for the hedging and, and of these positions, whether an insurance company or a pension fund, okay, then you need something more accurate. Cox and Gasol Rush not only told us how to price bonds, it also told us how to understand the risks of bonds, how sensitive they would be for movements of base interest rates. The same thing with mortgages. Everything is being driven by this. And what they showed us is that duration, I think you called it stochastic duration, but if I didn't, forgive me, okay? Stochastic duration gives us exactly the way finance people have thought about it from the option stuff and everything, in which you hedge the exposures of the under, from the underlying. In this case, the simple model, a single factor of the interest rate. In the more complicated model, like the one I showed up, the two one or the three interest rate model, you have, say, things like twos, tens, thirties, which is what people would calibrate the short run, intermediate run, long run. And you would look at it, you'd get all the twists and turns in the term structure and all their different risks. So the levels of the interest rates, the shape of the curves, and so forth. You really can hedge those in ways that a simple duration measure won't allow you to do very well. And so this is extremely practical. And this is not new in the sense that there's a great deal of market experience in doing this over many decades. So the learning curve here is well-traveled. So we have good information from the marketplace. We have the tools to extract it. And then we have the markets and the learning current experience and the models actually to use them to hedge these important exposures, whether they be inflation, interest rates, nominal or real, uh, currencies, and so forth. So I didn't exactly go through all of the model. And I certainly, despite the semblance of equations up there, I really didn't use them. But I wanted, I hope, to convey to you how important just that one line in Phil Dickler's list was. Now, just imagine if we did this for everything on that list. Of course, we'll be here until tomorrow. But I hope for even those who either don't find this particular part of the financial vineyard particularly interesting, you know, if you don't, I pity you. but. That's, uh, you know, that's the way it is. But even if you don't, or if you just come to this new, I hope you get the following. Oh, by the way, you know, I don't know about you, but when I hear a song I like, you know, if I don't like it, I don't care. I hear a song I like, the first time I hear it, she's singing, she's going, ba -da -da -ba -ba -ba. I don't know one word she's saying. But I like the song. So I listened to it 20 times. And guess what? By the 20th time, I know exactly what she's saying. So I hope in this brief th warm up for Steve, OK, that if you didn't get all the lyrics, I hope you got the melody. Thank you very much.